My name is Tim Simpson. I'm a cardiology fellow here at Oregon Health and Science University, and I'll be presenting a case of an axillary and pelvis supported PCI with rotor ablation. The case begins with a 64 year old female with a known history of three vessel coronary artery disease, comorbidities including hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, FPEF, who was admitted for a left lower extremity critical limb ischemia. She had previously undergone a right common femoral antarterectomy, femoral to PT bypass, and right external iliac stenting. She came in with 48 hours of left toe discoloration, pain, and numbness. The initial workup included a CTA with distal runoff demonstrating diffuse atherosclerotic disease in bilateral iliac systems, more distally bilateral SFA occlusions with patent bypass graft on the right and reconstruction of the popliteal on the left. She was taken to the operating room where she underwent to left external iliac, common femoral, and profunda endarterectomy. Her saphenous vein was harvested for a bypass to the PT distally. This course was complicated by a post-operative development of chest pain, dynamic ECG changes, and troponin elevation to 8.5. Given the constellation of findings, she was taken to the cath lab for coronary angiogram. Here in the RAO caudal view, you can appreciate a subtotal occlusion at the osteo left circumflex with left-to-left -left collaterals filling an OM. You can also appreciate the left-to-right collaterals filling an RPLA system with the right being CTO'd proximally. In the RAO crany, you can better appreciate the sequential heavily calcified proximal and mid-LAD stenosis. And again, here in our AP crany view, we can see the sequential heavily calcified 70 to 80 percent stenosis within the proxim mid-LAD. Given these findings, she was referred for a heart team discussion. Her comorbidities placed her at a 3.2 percent risk for mortality. She demonstrated a reasonable LAD target, but poor right and left circumflex given the CTO nature. And she also had limited conduits. Her aorta was heavily calcified on CT as well. Given this, she was considered to be a poor surgical candidate due to the calcified aorta, poor conduits, and poor targets, and was declined for cabbage. The decision was made to monitor with medical therapy initially and pursue PCI if she demonstrated ongoing ischemic symptoms. She returned to clinic just three weeks later on three antianginals with CCS class 3 angina. She was referred for PCI. Given the technical challenges of the heavily calcified prox and mid-LAD stenosis, the plan was made for hemodynamic support with an impella. Due to her severe peripheral arterial disease, highly stenotic right common femoral artery and recent left endarterectomy, the decision was made for percutaneous axillary impella placement. On day of intervention, an 8 French destination sheath was placed in the right femoral artery and a 5-6 slender sheath placed in the left radial artery. We began with a selective subclavian angiogram that demonstrated a vessel of moderate caliber size, minimal atherosclerotic disease, and without stenosis. We also documented the location of the thoracoacromial artery and the circumflex humeral artery. In planning for axillary artery access, we recall that the axillary artery originates from the subclavian as it passes the lateral border of the first rib and becomes extrathoracic. It's subsequently divided into three segments based on its relationship with the pec minor. Angiographically, those segments are identified by the origins of the arterial branches, the superior thoracic from the first, thoracoacromial and lateral thoracic from the second, and the subscapular from the third, the ideal access point being between the lateral thoracic and subscapular arteries. After identifying our landmarks, an 081 wire was advanced antegrade into the axillary artery for guidance, so-called wire-guided access to minimize repeat contrast injections. Entering just medial to the glenoid cavity and using a more shallow angle than a typical femoral approach, under fluoroscopy and ultrasound, we access the left axillary artery in the third segment using micropuncture technique. Two per-closed sutures were positioned in a pre-closed fashion at 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock, and an 8 French sheath was placed, upsized to the 14 French impella peel-away sheath. The impella device was advanced retrograde across the aortic valve into the LV and positioned under fluoroscopy. We used the 7 French EBU 40 guide to engage the left main artery and advance the pro water beyond the proximal and mid stenosis. This was then exchanged for a rota floppy wire. We're using a 1.5 millimeter burr requiring 11 passes at 160,000 RPM to modify the highly stenotic calcification in the proximal and mid LAD. 
These passes were associated with brief hypotension, which norepinephrine infusion was initiated. The lesion was predilated with a 2O and 25 NC balloon. Using angiographic sizing and considering the patient's small BMI of 1.9 and 63 kilo weight, a 25 by 38 resolute onyx DES was placed in the mid LAD, and a subsequent overlapping 3022 onyx DES was placed in the prox LAD, post dilated with a 3O NC balloon along its length, and a 325 balloon more proximally. Completion angiography showed full stent expansion, conversion of the 70 to 80 percent stenosis to 0 percent with TIMI 3 flow, no evidence of complication. The patient was weaned off norepinephrine, and the appella successfully weaned and removed. To utilize a dry closure technique, a 7 by 2 balloon was brought up from the right femoral artery over a wire and parked in the proximal subclavian artery. The balloon was inflated, the sheath removed, and the sutures tightened simultaneously. Angiogram showed a focal stenosis at the suture site, likely due to capture of the posterior wall of the vessel. A balloon was advanced, and the stenosis was dilated. Repeat angiogram showed successful fracture of the suture and resolution of the stenosis. However, it demonstrated a small non-flow limiting dissection for which prolonged balloon dilations were performed. Final injection showed good hemostasis, no extravasation, and no remaining stenosis. The patient was successfully weaned from anesthesia and extubated at the conclusion of the case and monitored overnight in the ICU. After a short hospital stay, she was discharged on DAPT. One month later, she returned to clinic, had marked improvement of her angina, and returned to normal functional capacity. Although femoral artery access is preferred for most large bore devices, patients referred for complex PCI frequently have co-occurring PAD, and this approach is not always safe nor feasible. The axillary artery is typically smaller in diameter, but it's infrequently affected by atherosclerosis and in most patients, capable of accommodating a 14 French impella sheaf without compromising distal flow. Although there's no prospective studies, ongoing registry and retrospective analysis has suggested that the axillary approach is reasonably safe and effective alternative access site. This case highlights the role of an alternative access impella due to iliofemoral disease and a high-risk PCI. Thank you.